Come on, put your hands together this morning. Put your hands together. God has been faithful. Amen. Put your hands together for the awesome band. They ministered well this morning. It's an honor for me to uh, minister to you this morning, and I thank uh, the leadership of the church for the opportunity. It's also the last day of July, which is the last day of the financial fitness fast. Put your hands together if you enjoyed the month. This section is a little bit quiet. Put your hands together if you enjoyed the month of July. We had amazing speakers week on week. We had amazing master classes on Saturdays. And we had amazing outreaches that we had the opportunity to do and serve in the kingdom of God. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving in the car with my sister. And we were reflecting on some of the sessions we had during this month. And I happened to ask her uh, if she had uh, done her spreadsheet yet. So in the beginning of the fast, there was this task of going through your expenses and your income, right? So whatever you get and where your money goes. So we were tasked to take six months of our bank statements and comb through them line by line to understand what it is we were using our money for. And I asked her, did you do your spreadsheet? She said to me, no, I haven't. Um, and because of the type of brother I am, I asked her, okay, when will you be able to do it? And she said, um, when, I, when I have time. And I said, okay, when will you know when you have time to do it? Um, and eventually she said to me, uh, where is this going anyway? What's the point of all of this? Right? And so I thought it was a very good question that we could discuss this morning. What is the point of being good stewards of our finances? What was the point of the month of July? If you have your Bibles with you, you will, can you turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy in chapters 15? Even if it's on your phone, you can turn there with me, Deuteronomy chapter 15. It's a very interesting scripture that I would love for you to follow along with. Deuteronomy chapter 15, we're going to start from verse 4. We're going to go all the way to verse 8 and then uh, jump from verse 8 to verse 10 and end off on verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 4, it says, However, there need be no poor people among you. I think my Bible is, is broken. Does yours say the same thing as well? However, there need be no poor people among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Jumping to verse 10, it says, Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. That's awkward. Because in the beginning we said there need be no poor people. And now the scriptures are saying there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. That's the reading of the word of God. The title of my message this morning is, This is the Point. This is the point where the promise God made to Abraham is about to materialize. 
Now, we learn about this man called Abraham, well, initially called Abram in the book of Genesis. And God comes to this man and he says, leave from your father's house so I can do a new thing through you. And God gives this man, Abram at the time, a challenge and a promise attached to it. That if you follow me, then out of your loins I will birth many nations. Now this man turns towards God and he says, How, Lord, how can you birth many nations out of me when I cannot even birth one? Now this was an elderly man married to an elderly woman. And they were struggling to have children. And God said to this man, I will do a thing so new that nations will use your name to show how good I am. And so the God of Abraham blesses him and he has Isaac as offspring. Now Isaac is blessed by God as well and has sons that he gives birth to. And one of those sons is Jacob. And so the story of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob continues as we know it. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, we're introduced to an elderly Moses. He's addressing the next generation of Israelites who are about to enter the land of Canaan. Now we learn about Moses in the book of Exodus, and God chooses this man who will be his mouthpiece, who will go to Pharaoh and petition for Pharaoh to let God's people go. And this man named Moses turns to God and he says, how will I be your mouthpiece when I can't even speak well? And God says to this man, I will do a thing so new that people will use your name to show how good I am. And so we see the story of the Israelites unfold through the book of Exodus as Moses obeys God and he goes to Pharaoh to petition for the people of Israel to be set free. Now in this piece of scripture we just read, it's been 40 years since God delivered Israel from the oppression they faced in Egypt. And throughout that journey, the Israel faced difficulty keeping their covenant with God. Right after they left or crossed the Red Sea, we see them come to the feet of the Mount of Sinai. And God speaks to all of them, giving them his law, giving them his counsel, the Ten Commandments as we know them. And right after they hear the voice of God, and Moses goes up the mountain, they build for themselves a golden calf and begin to worship it. So Moses is standing in front of a new generation of Israelites about to enter into the land of Canaan. And he reminds them of how they rebelled against the Lord when they arrived at Canaan the first time around. And God had to turn them away to walk around the wilderness for 40 years. Moses reminds them of the terms and conditions of their covenant with God. To love and to obey God. To worship no other God. Just like they had created the golden calf. And Moses reminds them that it's not because of your righteousness. You are here at the gate of Canaan, not because of your good deeds, not because you were so amazing, not because you were talented, but because of my grace and mercy over you. It is not because of your righteousness. And Moses says all these things to this generation of Israelites to prepare them for the blessing. Because sometimes the blessing is ready, but we may not be ready for the blessing. Sometimes the promise is ready, but we may not be ready for the promise. And so Moses reminding them of the covenant is to prepare them to enter this land called Canaan. Now, we know from the scriptures that the land of Canaan is a rich land. The Bible says this is a land flowing with milk and honey. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, from verse 10 to 12, it reads, and this is Moses speaking to them, he says, the land you were entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot, as in a vegetable garden. 
but the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drink rain from heaven. It is the land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continuously on it from the beginning of the year to its end. Now, I want to repeat that part. Moses says it is a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continuously on it from the beginning of the year to the end of it. This is before Israel inhabits the land. God was already watching over the land, even during the time his enemies were living in the land. And if it were you, if it were me for sure, I would have prayed for that land to be barren. We would have prayed for God to bring a curse on that land because his enemies lived in there. But God is not the God of shortcuts. That land was there. The land was good, but the land was occupied by people who did not revere God, people who practiced traditions and religion that was not consistent with what God wanted for his people. And so Moses tells this to prepare them for the blessing, to prepare them for the promise, to prepare them for the land, so they could be set apart. However, they need be no poor people among you. For in the land your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. However, there need be no poor people among you. There need be no poor people among you. And God knows that to be successfully set apart, you need to be fully dependent on him. God knows that to be successfully set apart, you need to be sure of yourself like when Jesus was tempted by the enemy on the mountain. God knows that to be successfully set apart, you need both bread and his word. God knows your needs have to be met, but through the right channels. So God wants us to be successfully set apart. This is the point. That we may be successfully set apart, where we can uh, successfully fulfill God's agenda without any fear or favor of what may happen. Now, as we've read in the scriptures, Moses is telling the Israelites this, knowing very well that they are about to go into a land that does not revere God, a land that does not believe what they believe, a land that does not practice what they have been taught to practice. And Moses knows that unless you are good stewards of that land, you will be delivered into the hands of your enemies once again. And in fact, Moses tells them this, and he gives them a song to recite whenever they find themselves in trouble. But God is gracious. God is good. And so Moses says, I believe that once you found yourself in exile, once you have been handed over to the hands of your enemies, that God will transform your heart, that God will transform our hearts, that we may fully love and obey God. Now, in the month of July, we had the opportunity to serve others, to serve people. Now, this was a good tension between restricting your financial habits and giving your money throughout the month giving your time throughout the month, giving your talents throughout the month. Now, all of the tribes had managed to execute on an outreach. And put your hands together for the teams that went out into the streets, executing on the food drives. It was amazing to be a part of. It was amazing to see. Now, for every session that I was able to be a part of, every time when we debrief amongst ourselves, the comment of, we should be doing more of this, came up time and time again. Now, unfortunately, ingredients, transport, clothing, all of these things cost money. 
Now, the point of us being good stewards of our finances is that we could successfully do what we have been sent to do. Now, in the book of Matthew, Jesus calls unto the disciples and he says, when I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. When I was downhearted, you did not visit me in prison or hospital. And this is what we have been sent to do, commissioned to do. And so there is a direct relationship between how successful we are in completing what we have been sent to do and us successfully managing our finances. Now I hope that the financial fitness will not stop in the month of July. That this will in fact be a habit that we practice daily and daily because the truth is the gospel is needed more so outside of these four walls than it is in here. The gospel is to edify the body of Christ that we may go out there and do the work of God. Now, it's very easy to compare each other in the land, to compare ourselves to each other in the land, right? Because we are in the land. And the scriptures say uh, there may or will always be poor people in the land. Now, it's relative to the Israelites. Moses is instructing them to give unto one another, to lend unto each other without holding a grudge. But there is a big difference between those in the land and those outside of the land. And so my encouragement to us this morning is to see ourselves as blessed, to see ourselves as good stewards, to see ourselves as having a surplus that we may be burdened to give to those who are outside of the land. Now this morning, you may be sitting and uh, hope said something incredible around um, if you feel like you've been beaten down in life, this is the utterance you need to make to tell yourself, to tell your situation that God has been faithful. Now, to honor that, the Holy Spirit wants us to be obedient to the word of God. The Holy Spirit wants us to be obedient to what God has commissioned us to do. And oftentimes, our finances are limitations to us doing that. And so the point of this month was for us to get a grasp and a grip over our financial affairs. And so the first altar call we'll make this morning will be for us to be good stewards of whatever we have been blessed with. We may not all be rich in the world's context. We may not all be living in mansions, but I believe that we all have something to give. I believe we all have something to share with those we have been sent to. Now, if you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering, how do I play a role in all of this? Now, Tepo mentioned as well, there's a bless the seed house, but I do want to stretch you beyond your current situation. I want to stretch your mindset to see everything you have in your hands. Money, time, talents, experience, exposure. And to find ways to give with those, to find ways to be generous with what you have. The Bible says those who are faithful with a little will be entrusted with much. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering how is it That with the little you have, or with the limitations you have, you play a role in doing what God has commissioned us to do. I want you just to put your hand up this morning. Just to put your hand up this morning, as it is important for us to be good stewards, to be agents in society, to do what God has sent us to do. Once again, it's easy for us to meet on Sunday here in the sanctuary. It's a bit different to go out during the week and to do the work of God. To continue to minister, to continue to give, to continue to be generous. And so if you are here this morning and you're saying, I don't know how I can be part of this story, you can just put your hand up. 
And just to make it easy for those, I'll just ask for us to bow our heads and close our eyes. For those who are wondering, how is it that they play a role in the story? God has given us much that we can share with the world. God has entrusted us to be good stewards of time, to be good stewards of our treasures, to be good stewards of our talent. And this morning as you're sitting here, I want you to think about what it is that God has blessed you with, to think about where it is that God has placed you, and to think about the people that are around you. It is no mistake that you are where you are. It is no mistake that you are surrounded by those you are surrounded by. It is no mistake that you are hearing this message today. And the challenge for you and I this morning is, what do we do with what we have? What is the point of us being here this morning? Father, we thank you for each and every person that has their hand raised, God. We thank you for every person that has given themselves to your gospel, that has given themselves to what you have sent us to do. We thank you, Lord, that whoever that you have placed around them, whoever that you have placed in their path, God, the environment that they're in, that they will be representatives of the gospel of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that in everything that we do, we will be good stewards of what you have blessed us with. God, may we see the societies around us change, Lord. May we see the people around us change because of us and the role that we play. God, may we see your hand through everything, God, that where we put our hands to, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will move, that your Holy Spirit will provide, your Holy Spirit will restore, your Holy Spirit will bless. I thank you, Lord, that you are looking for an available heart to do your work, that that is the only prerequisite, that this morning we may render ourselves available to your work. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this in your powerful name. Amen. Now, the second call I want to make is for those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The most important thing, and coincidentally, the easiest thing to overlook is to share the good news. Now, even when we were out doing, quote-unquote, the street work, talking to people, I mean, telling someone hungry there's food is very easy, right? It's a, pro it's a problem solution match. There's not much work into it. But ministering to that person becomes a bit of a challenge. It's outside our comfort zone. But that is the point of all of this. If we cannot share the gospel, if we cannot share the good news, if we cannot share the sacrifice that Jesus made, then we haven't fully done the job. Now, if you are here this morning and you're thinking, I haven't fully accepted, I haven't accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and you came into this well-ventilated space, you came to this nice-looking church with the beautiful people dressed well, the nice parking lot, none of that matters unless you accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. So if you're here this morning, and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Once again, I'm going to ask you to be brave and just to put your hand up. There's no shame in the presence of God. There's no shame in our past as long as we've come to God with an open heart. As long as we've come to God willing to lay ourselves as living sacrifices. So God, we thank you for every person that has their hand up this morning. We thank you, Lord, that this is the point. God, that as we continuously give of ourselves, give of our time, give of our finances, Lord, that the true reason is for you to reach out to the lost. We thank you that you are the shepherd that is willing to leave the 99 to go look for the one. 
And even if there is only but one whose hand is raised, God, we know that your word says that the heavens rejoice because your son or your daughter has come home this morning. That even though there may be one that may have their hand raised this morning, we know, God, that we have fulfilled the mandate to preach the gospel to those who don't know it. We thank you, Lord, for you leading your people to you, God. We thank you that we can be good stewards of your gospel, not only in the four walls of the church, but in our daily lives, we can be good stewards of your gospel. Father, we pray that you inhabit the hearts of those who have their hands up this morning, that they may learn to know you like we know you, God, that they may also sing that all their lives you have been faithful, that they may also see your hand move in and around them. God, we thank you that we have the privilege to partner with you as you save those who need it the most. We thank you, Lord, that this was the reason for us going through this season. We thank you, Lord, that we will not stop here, but we will be a church of generosity, that we will be a church that gives, that we will be a church that sees the social ills in our country and puts our hand up to serve where there is no service, to give where there is nothing, to clothe where there is no clothing, God, to feed where there is hunger, that we will be the ones to take up the challenge. I thank you, God. For this ministry, we thank you for each and every partner, Lord. And as they have showed themselves to be good stewards, God, we pray for a blessing tenfold. God, that you will enable them to manage the overflow that is coming in their lives, God. That we can be stewards, good stewards of many, if we have shown ourselves to be good stewards of the few. We thank you, Lord. Bless us this morning as we continue to look up to Jesus, the Savior, the provider, the one who gives life, the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who we do all of this for. And the people of God said, amen and amen. Thank you for the opportunity to minister to you this morning.